welcome back to another episode of the Mega Drew Show. This time, we're going to be taking a look at Taito's Operation Wolf series. The franchise made a big impact in arcades in the late 80s, and it set the standard for the light gun genre. So insert coin, grab an Uzi, and get ready for action. Let's begin with the game that started it all. Operation Wolf, released in 1987. You take on the role of Roy Adams, a soldier tasked with rescuing civilians from a prison camp. As the game begins, you parachute into the action before receiving a briefing of your missions. You start off armed with a machine gun with limited magazines and several grenades. It's always worth trying to use the grenades to take out multiple vehicles or groups of enemies when you're under heavy enemy fire. Throughout each stage, health and ammo pickups become available, which are usually obtained by shooting at a defenseless animal or knocking down coconuts from trees. Health pickups come in the form of what I always assumed were bottles of Pepsi, which I assume Roy has to consume at the same time as shooting down enemies. The action takes place over six stages, with the opening scene taking place at the communication setup. Your journey takes you through a jungle, a village, an ammunition supply station, and finally an airport, where you attempt to help the hostages escape on a plane. The game is fairly short, but it keeps you immersed, and the recoil from the gun controller really makes you feel like part of the action. The cabinet was one of the most expensive at the time due to its size and design. It was the highest grossing arcade machine in the UK in 1988, and the home ports were consistently at the top of the sales charts for some time. My experience of the home ports was mainly with the ZX Spectrum version, which was very impressive. The limitations of the system meant it was never going to be close to the arcade game, but it was definitely the next best thing. With its realistic gun controller, impressive visuals, and intense gameplay, Operation Wolf was a sensation. It spawned several sequels and countless imitators, cementing its place as a pioneer in the light gun shooter genre. This was a big favourite of my dad's, and I used to watch him play this whenever we visited an arcade. The only thing missing was a two-player feature, and that conveniently brings us on to the next game in the series, Operation Thunderbolt. In 1988, Taito released Operation Thunderbolt. This time, you could team up with a friend in two-player cooperative mode, adding a whole new dimension to the gameplay. You reprise the role of Roy Adams, who has been brought in to rescue the hostages that have been taken prisoner when a plane is hijacked. Roy is joined this time by fellow soldier Hardy Jones, and the duo begin their first mission, gathering intelligence information. One of the most impressive new features is the use of scaling in several stages. This gives you a sense of progressing forward, whether on foot, by jeep, or by boat. Like its predecessor, Operation Thunderbolt received many ports to home computers, with Ocean winning awards for best arcade to home conversion. In 1994, a Super Nintendo port was released, and for a game that was already six years old, you'd expect a fairly decent conversion given the hardware. In an attempt to expand the game, it lost all of its character and the intensity of the original arcade game. The animation is choppy, the scaling is poor, and the whole experience felt very dated. The port did have an option to use the infamous Super Scope or the SNES Mouse, but it was going to take more than using a plastic rocket launcher to rescue this port. In 1991, East Technology developed Double Dragon 3, which unfortunately brought this iconic beat-em-up series crashing down. It's no surprise that when they were tasked with making a third Operation Wolf game, things weren't looking great. Operation Wolf 3 arrived in arcades in 1994, the same year as Sega's Virtua Cop and Namco's Point Blank. The development team went down the digitised graphics route in an attempt to add realism to the action. Big mistake. This completely destroyed the series' character, turning one of the most iconic arcade games into a bland, lifeless shooter. The stages are dull, as you start off in a warehouse being shot at by generic bad guys. 
things don't improve much and even taking out a huge helicopter and chasing moving vehicles doesn't do anything to improve the experience. The game lacked all of the style and innovation of the first two games and when compared to other games in the genre that were released in the same year, it was a massive disappointment. The fourth and final arcade game in the series was 1998's Operation Tiger. This is a largely forgotten arcade game that I vaguely remember seeing when it was first released. It's probably a better game than Operation Wolf 3, but by today's standards the 3D graphics haven't aged well. Taito were definitely trying to mimic the popular light gun games of that era, but unfortunately it comes up a bit short when comparing it to other examples of the genre. The fact that neither Operation Wolf 3 or Operation Tiger received home ports says a lot about the downfall of the series. The likes of House of the Dead, Time Crisis and Virtua Cop led the way in the latter part of the 90s, leaving the Operation Wolf series behind until it faded away completely. Until now. In 2023 the series made a comeback with Operation Wolf Returns First Mission. This reimagining was developed by Microids and originated as a virtual reality game using Steam VR, MetaQuest 2 or PlayStation VR. The game features a modern art style, a new story and a choice of weapons that can be switched in-game. It's a welcome return for the series and although it lacks most of what made the original game so iconic, it's entertaining and worth checking out. The Operation Wolf series had its ups and downs, but its impact on the light gun shooter genre is undeniable. The 1987 original was a groundbreaking game that set a new standard for the genre with its innovative controls, intense action and immersive atmosphere. The game played such a big part in shaping my love for arcade games and if I ever see an original cabinet when I visit an arcade, it's a game I will always play. You have sustained a lethal injury. Sorry, but you are finished. Here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below and subscribe to the channel for more retro gaming content.